God be the glory. Great things God has done, is doing, and promised to do along the way. Because God is our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We lift up our spirits now as we pray to that creator God, that God would indeed be present with us in this moment of proclamation. Let us pray. Eternal God, recognizing your power, your strength, and your presence, we humble ourselves before you. And we pray, God, that as we have gathered in this space, you will take uh, the arena of this service and touch a life. Thank you, God, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and what our hearts are about to receive. We pray this prayer in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all who are able to say together, amen. To God be the glory, great things God has done. Today, if you have your word, we invite you to turn with us to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, reading verses 22, 23, and 24. Let us read and hear God's precious word. The eye is the lamp unto the body, and if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And for this moment of preaching, I invite you to hear verses 22 and 23 of this pericope for it serves as a background and a backdrop to where we hope and believe that God will deliver a word. For the Bible says that I is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And this day, for a brief moment, I invite you to hear this scripture as we lift up and preach on our subject, fatal attraction. Fatal attraction. My friends, in the midst of all that has happened in the last seven days, and even in the midst of all of that has transpired since last night, I pray that you will hear from me today and that you will have an open heart and a receptive mind to this message of proclamation. For on this day, I remind you of the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who says, ye should know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And as a preacher of inspiration and as a preacher of liberation, I am asking for all truth tellers and all truth followers to sit up and lean forward and to listen to this message on this Sabbath day. Because the first thing I would like to say is that because of our sinful nature and because of the propensity, the proclivity, and the tendency that we have to do our will and not God's will, and because many of us see things the way we want to see them and not as they are, and because all too often we try to make ourselves look better in the eyes of others, discounting the reality that we ain't all that we say we are. I want to quote to you one of the newscasters this week who said it best, for he says, we are as bad as we behave, and our behavior shows that we are bad. Somebody say amen if you can. For what I'm saying at this point, y'all, is that what we saw in Washington last week is a part of who we are, and who we are has been this way for a long time. Let me explain to you what I'm saying. For if you will go back with me to December the 7th, 1941, it was approximately 1.55 p.m. on the East Coast and 7.55 a.m. in Honolulu when uh, Japanese attack planes began to drop bombs on the naval base Pearl Harbor. At the end of that bombing, 2,403 persons were dead. At the end of that bombing, then President Roosevelt began to give these infamous words, this day will go down in infamy. Friends, this is who we are, a country under attack, but also this is who we are. 
because on the evening of April the 4th, 1968, on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, an assassin's bullet pierced the air, coming through the jaw, coming in now to the cranial portion of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And he lay there on the balcony of the Lorraine. Dr. King, a magnum cum laude graduate from Morehouse College. Dr. King, a trained theologian from Boston University, lost his life that night. One life was lost, but millions felt the pain. That is who we are. Are, that is what we are about. A nation under attack, but a nation that will also attack its own. Stay with me because on September the 11th, 2001, at approximately 8.46 a.m., a United Airlines flight number 175 bound to Los Angeles hit one of two of the trade, twin, trade towers uh, there in New York City. That was just one of three flights that made its attack on that day that 2,996 people lost their lives. On on that day, 25,000 individuals were hurt. On that day, $10 billion of damage was, was assessed to the United States. This is who we are, and this is who we have become, under attack as well as attacking. And so it should not be a surprise to you that on Wednesday, January the 6th, 2021 in an afternoon, about 1.40 in the afternoon, uh, less than 24 hours after another Morehouse man had made history. There was what we call an attack on the United States. Elected officials uh, seated in the House to simply go through a ceremonial uh, confirmation of the Electoral College uh, votes. But as the reporter said, a riotous mob as the media call them hoodlums and thugs. They attacked a federal building, desecrated the interior, broke, stole, and looted private property. In essence, y'all, they wrote another page in the history books that would go down as a day of infamy. This is who we are, and this is who have we have become. You see, I don't want you to miss the important fact, my friends, what sin does and how sin divides and how sin separates and how sin in and of itself is the reason that we need Almighty God. I don't want you to forget, my friends, the importance of knowing that any time that God does not lead, God is not in charge. When God is not in charge, mayhem is bound to happen. That is what we are on the heels of January the 6th. That is what we are facing and living in right now. This, this is a, 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 a unfortunate tribute to one of the worst leaders we've ever elected. He, he causing an insurrection. This is what happened happens, my friends, when you let sin take hold of you. This is what happens, my friends, when you have people who march supposedly peacefully, but it turns into a mob. This is what happens, my friends, when you are following a fatal attraction. A woman lost her life. A police officer lost his life. Individuals have been arrested, but also are still in the hospital because of a fatal attraction. And I don't want you to miss it because the subject of this sermon was, was, was actually precast a whole week before uh, the events of January the 6th. But I want you to recognize that when people take matters into their own hands and leave God out of the equation, that is nothing other than a fatal attraction. And as you've heard that great Chicago preacher said before, chickens will come home to roost. And on January the 6th, what was done in the dark came out into the light. On January the 6th, what you began to see uh, 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 coming up and people tried to claim this is not who we are. Oh, yes, this is who we are. Let me tell you who we are because in 18, 1838, the United States put federal troops on the land and in the homes of Native Americans and marched them all over the South out to Oklahoma. They call it the Trail of Tears. United States forces, y'all, took individual out of their home, Native Americans. Why? Because they felt a threat of the people that they had conquered. They felt a threat of the individuals who were here 
here before they got here, they felt a threat of these individuals and they pushed them out to Oklahoma. Parenthetically, once they found oil in Oklahoma, they tried to push them away. This is who we are for in 18, 16, 1857, there's something called the Dred Scott decision, which the United States Supreme Court says that the United States Constitution has no rights, no responsibility for people of color. That meant that anybody from Africa or looked like African would not be able to be respected by the United States Constitution. This is who we are. This is who we are. Is that not what happened from 1870 to 1959? Jim Crow laws were instituted in the South. Jim Crow laws that said it was against the law for people of color to associate with anybody unlike them. You couldn't marry them. You couldn't go to dinner with them. You couldn't live with them. Couldn't go to the same public accommodations. Jim Crow laws from 1870 to 1959. This is who we are. This is what we have become. Is that not the same thing that when President Roosevelt began to say that this day would go down in infamy, that's 1941, but in 1942, this same president locked up more than 120,000 Japanese Americans, 120,000 individuals from the Pacific Islands because they looked like they were Japanese, put them out of their homes, put them in concentration camps. Is this who we are? Yes, this is who we are because three years later, we are the only country to ever have dropped an atomic bomb, not on the military, but on individuals. And more than a million folk on two atomic bomb attacks died, y'all, unnecessarily. This is who we are. And this is who we have become. And my friends, the only way that I can stand before you and say I can keep my sanity, the only way that I can stand before you with a sense of hope in my heart is to recognize that I serve a God and I serve a Lord who sits high and looks low, looks beyond my faults, still meets my need because this is who I am and this is what I have become. Let me see if I can help you understand it this way, because there's a quote by Wayne the Dreyer, y'all, that helped me get some understanding of what fatal attraction is. Wayne Dreyer says, change the way you look at things, and the things you look at change. Let me say it again. Change the way you look at things, and the things you look at change. And this quote was given to me by our own member, uh, uh, Ms. Rosebud Turner, who said that when she was training teachers and administrators, she would always put this quote on the board so people can get a different perspective and begin to understand that if you change the way you look at things, you will look at things differently. And that's what fatal attraction is. A fatal attraction requires us to change the way we look at things. What's the definition of a fatal attraction? It is is an attraction between an individual or someone or something that is so strong that the individual lacks reason, logic, and judgment in dealing with that attraction. Let me say that again. It's a fatal attraction when you become so enamored, so engrossed, so overwhelming with that thing or, or someone that they cause you to have a lack of reason or judgment. This is what happens, y'all, when our eyes are not on Almighty God. This is what happens, y'all, when the focus is on me, myself, and I. This is what happens, y'all, when you believe a lie, you follow a lie, and you understand the lie it, it needs to be dealt. This is what happens. You've got to change the way you look at things, and the things you look at will Change. Let me see if I can help you understand this because what is one of the unfortunate benefits of living, y'all, in a modern side society of convenience that we have begun, began to become hypnotized, shall we say, by entertainment hypnotized by entertainment. It, 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 is, it is like the opium of the people. We watch too much television and too much internet, and now it has become our modus operandi. We can't begin the day nor end the day without looking at somebody else entertain us. We, we have done that because then it now reduces our ability to interact with other folk. 
There's no question in my mind that we have a fatal attraction because we want to be fed on me, myself, and I, and not look to you, yours, and y'all's. It's, it's not about me. It has to always be about God. You see, if you change the way you look at things, you'll look at things differently. Let me see if I can illustrate this to you. There is a picture that maybe you've seen of a duck and a rabbit. Now, I've kind of let the cat out of the bag. Sorry for the spoiler. The question is, which do you see? Do you see the duck or do you see the rabbit? See, seeing things differently means you will see different things. Let me see if I can give it to you another way. There's a picture of a woman. Now, for the sake of presentation, I put both side by side. On the left side, you will see an older woman. On the right side, you will see a younger woman. Now, the issue is when you see this one picture, you may not be able to see both of them, but when you flip to the other side. When you flip one upside down, when you flip uh, the picture, you begin to see things differently. And I hope I'm talking to somebody on this day. Right now, you're looking at me because I have a sense that God is calling you to flip some things in your life. God is calling you to flip the way you look at people and to flip the way they look at you. God is calling you to flip how you speak to folk and flip uh, how you approach people and flip Flip how you may think that you've been a blessing to them, but thanks be to God, they might be a blessing to you. Will you give God praise right there for the opportunity of flipping things and flipping people and flipping circumstances in your life? The God that we serve is a God who knows how to flip things that we can see them differently. For you see, this is exactly what Matthew 6 is really all about. This Sermon on the Mount, y'all, is where Jesus is teaching his disciples, talking about their priorities. He's asking them to flip the thought process of being so enamored and so attracted to material things that they forget their heavenly calling. He's asking them to flip their circumstances around that they will understand that more blessed to give than it is to receive. This is what we preached about on last week in part one of the series, that the way of your treasure, your heart, says where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Come here, Reverend, uh, the good Reverend Mac, because he gave me a quote that I've got to share again. He says, our treasures are not necessarily material possessions, but instead it is an orientation of the things we let our lives evolve around. I treasures. They're not just stocks and bonds and gold and silver and Cadillacs and, and Lexus and Mercedes. No, our treasures are where our heart begins to orientate. What wakes us up in the morning, what keeps us up at night, what we will go out of our way to make sure that we get more of that. That is where your treasure is. Jesus is teaching y'all that the only way to have secure treasures is to store them up in heaven. Let me go back to good Reverend Mac because he says where well, your heart, the word heart that Jesus implies in this text, y'all, is used in scripture to refer to the seat of your personality. Seek of your personality. That is what the Old Testament says, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. Jesus is trying to help us through the word, recognizes that your treasure is your orientation, but your heart, that's your determination. Your treasure is where you want to work for, but your heart is what you live for. I like the way that, that Dr. Maya Angelou says there is a difference between making a life and making a living. Somebody hear what I'm saying because verse 21 of this text, Jesus gives a reason to store up treasures in heaven because that's the only place where thieves and moth and rust will not come in and steal. And you've got to hear what he says here in verse 22. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body body will be full of light. Hear what the Bible is saying to us, friends. We have to know that there is only room for one master in our life. 
And the Bible lets it be known you can't serve both God and money. The Bible says that Jesus gives this, you got to separate the two. God, we have to realize this, y'all, is a God of all the things we desire. But we cannot have what God has unless we have God. Let me back it up and say that again. God will never separate love, peace, joy, hope, and faith because that's who God is. God is not going to break off a little piece of God to give you something of God to feed your own ego. No, God will say, if you want peace, you got to have God. If you want love, you got to have God. If you want hope, you got to have God. If you want faith, you got to have God. Y'all, you got to realize you've got to be all in when it comes to God. The Bible says that the light of the body is the eye. It's like a window pane, a window pane. And y'all know all good and well is that sometimes when your windows are dirty, you don't get good light into your house. Is somebody going to say amen there? Sometimes when your windows are dingy and dirty, you're going to have to wash them on your automobile. When you have the sleet and the salt and all that other stuff from last week and you couldn't see out of your windshield, what did you do? You pushed that little button and water sprayed on your windshield and the wipers went back swish, swish, swish and all of a sudden you can see a whole lot better. Am I talking to somebody that God has placed you in front of this YouTube, in front of this screen because God says I need to wash some things off the windshield of your life. Wash some things so you can see clearly. Wash some stinking thinking from your past so you can recognize the power of God right now. The good news y'all is that God says it's like a window pane. It's a lamp to your soul. To your soul. Let's see if we can go quick because don't forget, y'all, that the Sermon on the Mount is tailored to teach us not instructions on how to act, but it's tailored to teach us about how we are to live. When you are living these principles out, you are moving beyond the fatal attraction. What you're saying, Reverend, you see, there are certain things that would distort our views. Number one is prejudice. Number two is jealousy. Number three is conceit. I'm not saying you got to name people who have these qualities, but I think we know at least one or two folk that's got at least two or three of them in their life. It would distort your view if you are prejudice of somebody, prejudging them before you know all of the facts. You see, don't be jumping to a conclusion unless you're going to jump in and do something about it. Be careful about the jealousy that we sometimes will have of other folk. You don't know what the price they paid to get what they have. Yes, the grass looks greener on the other side, but you don't know what water bill they paying. And there's also conceit. Conceit, y'all, will, will distort our views of folk. And this conceit, y'all, will help us think by privilege we're better than other folk. That's why many of us of color got so upset when we saw how the Black Lives Matter protest was approached based upon police and based upon uh, uh, security officers and how this protest on January the 6th, it was like open door policy. Come on in. Let's take some selfish. We have to recognize is that we live in a divided consciousness that sometimes out of jealousy and prejudice and conceit will treat folk differently. The Bible says we got to have a healthy eye. And what is a healthy eye? The eye is a lamp unto the body. So then if your eye is clear, it says your whole body is full of light. To connect with verse 21 and 22, it teaches us that the heart, the heart, my friends, is is won by what the eye sees. The heart is won by what the eye see. The, the heart, not just the physical sight, but your heart, the place where God dwells, is won by what the eye see. So if you see inclusion, guess what? Your heart will be an inclusive heart. If you see that whosoever will, let them come, guess what? Your heart will be open and you will say, come on in. If you see the possibilities, your heart will say, all things are possible to those that believe. The Second point of verse 22 is very interesting because it says the eye is clear and the body will be full of light. The Greek word for clear here has a reference to move on just one purpose. We're talking single focus, y'all. It speaks of not being confused by complicated things. 
And that might be a word for somebody who's watching right now. Your life is so complicated and so confused, you can't see the grace of Almighty God. Your life is so full of, 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 of other stuff that you can't receive the spirit that God has given to you. You see, God gives us a centeredness. God gives us a one, I call it a, a one, per, one word purpose statement, and that is salvation. And the church of Jesus Christ must be about that one thing. I have learned to raise two questions in terms of the boundaries of ministry that I want to be involved in. Number one, is it going to lead somebody to Christ and strengthen their relationship? And number two, can I share what I've been talking and preaching about? Number one, is it going to lead you to a closer relationship with the Lord? Number two, is it going to allow you to share the things that God has placed in your life? See, unhealthy eye is mentioned in verse 23 because it tells us is that, but if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. In verse 23, Jesus used another word to speak of the eyes being unhealthy. He says it leads to darkness. It is bad. The Greek word for bad here speaks of the eye is diseased and defective. And I thank God that we have healing in our community and healing in our land, in healing by people many times that have been hurt. But thanks be to God, just because you hurt don't mean you can't be helped. Thanks be to God, just because you're down don't mean God can't pick you up. Is that not a shout out, y'all, to Stacey Abrams? I'm talking about the daughter of some United Methodist pastors. I'm talking about an individual born in Grand Rapids, raised in Gulfport, Mississippi, finding herself graduating cum laude from, from Avondale High school out in Atlanta, Decatur, Georgia. Is that not her story? Going to Spelman College, is that not her story? Graduating with a degree from the University of Texas, is that not her story? Graduating with a law degree from Yale, is that not her story? That she lost the election, the gubernatorial election, but she has registered more people than what she lost the election about. Is that not her story? That somebody can shout that though they booed her, she had a way of coming back? Okay, I got ahead of myself, but I want you to recognize every now and then a loss does not determine your legacy. A loss does not have to be the last word that said about you. You see, the spiritual unhealthy eye is the eye that constantly looks where it should not be looking. The spiritual unhealthy eye is the eye that does not see things as they should be seen. That's why I was not surprised when I saw that mob of folk walking down Constitution Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue, on their way to the Capitol, because in 1925, there was another mob dressed in white robes doing the very same thing in the very same city. Don't you be surprised that it ain't the first time that mobs have marched on the Capitol building. We we have to wake up, check up, lift up, and recognize God is still in charge. Amen. You see, the close of verse 23, y'all, Jesus is pointing out that the darkness that results from a bad eye is so great that no human language can adequately describe it. That's just why he says it's dark. The person with a bad eye lives without direction. The life is fulfilled with misery because there is no union with Almighty God. And the last part I want to make comes from verse 24 because I don't want you to forget it because it says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot save both God and money. You see, no one can serve and go in two different directions. No one can have your loyalty here and then your affection over there. Yes, your, your body might be here with me, but if your mind's on the other side of town, we ain't compatible. Though we may talk about it, but if we're not going to be about it, we're not going to be in union to reach the ultimate goal of God before us. God, my friends, is constantly confronting us with choices. Would it be money or will it be God? Will it be treasures or will it be uh, uh, serving? Will it, what, what would be the choice that you would make on this day? And recognize materialism. Materialism is the thought process. 
Because if you worship materialism, it would determine your behavior. And you determine your behavior because of what you believe. So let me break it down like a fraction, give it this way to you, I'm out of here. What you believe determines how you behave, and how you behave determines what you become. What you believe determines how you behave. If you believe a lie, you behave following a lie. And you behave following a lie, which makes you a lie. What you believe determines how you behave. If you believe materialism is your God, you behave in a way to keep focusing and worshiping materialism. If you believe that one person has all the answers, you behave as a one person will have all the answers. If you believe a certain way, you will behave a certain way. If you behave a certain way, that's what you will become. And what Jesus is saying in the text, I want you to believe that God Almighty has all power and that God Almighty has all strength and that God Almighty has what it takes. I, I want you to believe in such a way that you will move away from being hypnotized by lies and start believing in the truth. What was one of my first words I said in this message? Jesus says, ye should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And you see, when you understand the truth, you recognize, I got to cut off the TV, cut off the internet, and pick up a book. Somebody say amen. I, I, I've got to stop getting my joys and my, 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 my thrills from watching other folk do things. I need to do something myself. I need to pick up the phone and make a phone call. You see, I've got to change my perspective. And don't miss this. When you change your perspective, first of all, you will get rid of the tube. You will get rid of those addictions. Second, you will start talking to more people. And as you talk to them, you'll learn their story. As you learn their story, you will change your view. And you change your view. You, you start seeing things differently. And third, go back and repeat number one and two. Because you see, that's exactly what happened, I believe, that happened to Reverend Dr. Warnett. Reverend Dr. Warnett happens to be my closed shout for the day because Reverend Dr. Warnett is now a Georgia from, uh, a senator from Georgia. I'm talking about a preacher's son who is a preacher, a Morehouse man who is a leader, an alpha man who is a leader. I want you to recognize that this, that this Morehouse graduate preacher father is one who recognized that if I start listening to people more, I can serve them better. I, I give a shout out to Senator Warnock, but I give a shout out not just to him, but to all of those who began to listen. And as they listen, their perspective changed. Because you see, you're going to have to go through some things in life. As you go through, you cannot listen to the naysayers. You have to listen to what God places in your life. Is there anybody right now will help Help me give God thanks, not for the naysayers, but give God thanks for what the naysayers inspired you to do. Is that not exactly what we pick up on our closing here? A uh, hymn says, his eye is on the sparrow. Why should I weep? Why should I worry? His eye is on the sparrow. Song sung by Lauren Hill. Now, what I like about Lauren Hill's rendition of this is because Lauren Hill has gone through some things. I'm talking to Fuji's Lauren Hill. I'm talking about the misunderstanding, miseducation of Lauren Hill. I'm talking about somebody who found themselves on soap operas and found themselves on the big screen. Lauren Hill, y'all, who at 13 years old sung on the stage of the Apollo Theater and was booed. Boo! I mean, can you imagine a Grammy Award winner getting booed? Can you imagine Boo and Lauren Hill, who has sold more records than anybody can sit in the Boo, Lauren Hill. But here's her shout, y'all. She did not let the boo stop her from being bossed by all. But you, you missed it right there. She did not let what people were saying to her and holding her down stop her from being lifted up in the presence of Almighty God. And I invite you right now in the spirit, not of a Lauren Hill, in the spirit of our Lord that says, I'm with you every step of the way, in the spirit of our Savior that tells you, I will not forget you, I will not forsake you, in the spirit of our our Savior that says all things are possible to those that believe. I invite you not to be consumed by a fatal attraction, but I want you to be invited by an ultimate salvation.
Today, today, as you watch this video, as you worship with us, I want you to recognize that God has a word for you. And God has an invitation for you to be closer, not to be in a broken relationship, to be in a close relationship with him. And in so doing, we pray now that that relationship comes into your reality. We pray that somebody who has felt distant, somebody who has felt estranged, somebody who didn't even know about church world, will now hear this invitation. Here's the invitation, that you yourself will be a part of what God is doing. You yourself will accept not just your role, but accept your blessings. We invite you in this word of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity. We praise you for this invitation. God, we confess that we've been attracted to things and sometimes people that were not about you. So we pray that on this day that we make a decision not to follow money, not to follow mammon, but to follow you. God, we pray that not just the decisions we make today will make us whole, but God, it will have a ripple effect on those around us. God, let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friends, thank you so much for being a part of this worship experience. Thank you again for who you are. Please, please contact the church. You can write to us on www.cnjenkins.org. You can call the church. You can text us, whatever it takes for us to stay connected with you. This is Pastor Cannon. Do you know I love you? We're praying for you. Ask God's blessing to be upon you this day and for every day of your life. God bless you. Have a great day.